And the first conversation we will have is between Senator Tim Kaine and Ann Fulton. Senator Tim Kaine, elected to the Senate in 2012, serves on several key committees and is passionate about expanding job opportunities, especially through career and technical education and ensuring veterans' welfare. A staunch advocate for a strategic defense policy, he opposes unauthorized military interventions and believes in affordable health care for all. And, and Holton, after her tenure as interim president of George Mason University from 2019 to uh, 2020, now serves as a professor in multiple departments here at George Mason. And uh, she's a senior fellow at, at Policy Forward. Holding degrees from Princeton and Harvard Law, she has dedicated her life to the advocacy of children and families in Virginia. Having diverse experiences ranging from a legal aid lawyer to Virginia's Secretary of Education. Uh, currently, she's on the Virginia Board of Education and lives in Richmond with her husband, a U.S. Senator. And that happens to be Tim Kaine. So when I talk about conversation, we are talking about the conversation. I think, you know, true sense, a conversation between um, husband and wife and two people who know the Carters and, and two people who are closely connected with George Mason University and the Carter School. So I'm really delighted to welcome both of them. And I cannot wait for this conversation. Let's start. Senator Tim Kaine and Ann Holton, over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Dean Oserdam. I had the pleasure of, as you know, getting to work with you when you were first here at Mason during my interim presidency year, which was one year, but I say it was really seven dog years because it was the beginning of the pandemic and, and many other uh, big transitions for the university. But one of the pleasures was to get to know you and work with you and then to work, uh, uh, watch your work and assist where I could along the way in in uh, renaming uh, the school for um, uh, President and Mrs. Carter, which we're so thrilled to do and to get to celebrate uh, the legacy here today. So uh, I, I do have a few handful of personal reflections which uh, of the Carters, which I'll share at some point, but I'm going to start out asking my husband questions. Um, because he's got more to offer on the policy chop side of things. So we'll start with that. And so, uh, Tim, why don't you just start out with sharing uh, your some of your reflections about President Carter's leadership and legacy and lessons for our time. I'll jump in, but my wife really does have personal connection to the Carters through her parents, and I'm going to fire questions back at her about that a little bit further in. I don't have the personal tie with the Carters, but I remember the president very well, because as many of you, one of the votes you'll most remember is the first vote that you cast, right? So the first vote that you cast is always going to be one that will be in your mind. And my first vote was in the presidential election of 1976. Now, there are some here who are my age who completely get this, but there are others who are younger who don't. It was such a challenging time in American life, and it has some parallels to now. Um, Growing up, age five, I had come home and my mother was crying in front of the TV because JFK had been assassinated. Uh, five years later, I, I saw my parents cry over the assassinations of MLK and RFK. Uh, riots at the Democratic Convention in 1968 in Chicago, Vietnam, Vietnam War protests, civil rights protests, and then a president resigning in 1974 when I was 16 years old. So my formative time in kind of coming to understand the world of American politics between age five and 16 seemed every bit as tumultuous and maybe even more so than the time we're living in right now. And so then you go to the 1976 election. I had been in, we, we were probably in middle school when the constitution was changed to allow 18 year olds to vote. And so this is a big deal and it's a presidential election and it's a presidential election in the shadow of Nixon's resignation, President Ford's pardon of President Nixon, President Ford running for a full term, but a governor from Georgia. I was growing up in Kansas City. I, I didn't know much about Georgia and pay attention to it, but a governor of Georgia promising uh, some healing. Um, and so this, this conflict resolution um, school that, that is heavily about 
President Carter's presidency and post-presidency looking at global conflict really had its roots um, in Georgia, Georgia coming out of civil rights struggles. I ended up working for a federal judge in Georgia who was a Carter appointee to the bench, and he was appointed because he had been a school board member in Macon, Georgia, who had tried to heal divisions within the local community over school desegregation. So I think that the, the beginning point for, you know, offering comments about Jimmy Carter is as a as an individual leader and then governor before he was president, he came out, came out of a background where there was intense division around civil rights issues, and he was uh, going to be a healer. And that was how he ran as president in 1976. That's why he won the presidency in 1976. Americans were wanting to turn a page and embrace a new chapter that was not so divisive. You know, I would say, knowing Ann's dad, Ann's dad was the first Republican governor of Virginia, and she'll tell the personal stories, but they were governors at the same time, and each was a Southern governor trying to kind of reform who their party had been to make the Republican Party relevant in the South and to make the Democratic Party less of a Dixiecrat segregationist party. And so these two governors had a lot in common. Um, Then the other comment I'll make, and then I'll have a question for you, is President Carter, there was was a lot going on during that presidency, a lot going on. I mean, it's kind of amazing to think of in the four-year term how many things were going on at home and in the world. But, and I know there's going to be a panel on this later, uh, specifically about the Camp David Accords. But um, that was an expression of many things. I think my friend Mark Sickles talked about President Carter's faith life as a person. The Camp David Accords was about that, um, about his own faith um, and and a community, in particular Jerusalem, sacred to Jews and Christians and Muslims. That was a motivator for him. And it was also connected to his uh, belief that I, I've got to be a healer, healer in my state, healer in my country, healer in the world. That was um, a breakthrough, but a very controversial one. The, the first Arab state to really recognize Israel, and in some ways the most influential, um, certainly as an Arab state, it, it, Egypt is probably the largest, just in terms of population, enormously influential. And that would have seemed like a low odds proposition to try to find a normalization at that time, 1978, 1979. But President Carter's both personal background and then his work as a healer in public office led to that. It was enormously controversial. It cost Anwar Sadat his life. Anwar Sadat, the the leader of Egypt who entered into that agreement, was assassinated two years later by individuals who were part of a movement that vehemently opposed the normalization of Egypt to Israel. But but that normalization paved the way a number of years later for the Jordanian recognition of Israel under President Clinton. And then you can even draw a line to the Abrahamic Accords of President Trump. Um, had, had Egypt not normalized relations with Israel, I'm not sure the others would have happened. It was risky. First, to, to try something when you... Th- when the odds would say you're likely to fail, it's always risky because just being a being a public servant and going out on a limb for something that could well fail, probably not going to happen, is always risky. But then obviously the death of Sadat and the continuing challenges uh, in the Middle East demonstrate this is not an easy topic. It's a it is a an extremely difficult topic. We're living through that today. I imagine many of you in the room have really intense feelings today about what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, there's very little percentage in an American president trying to get in and trying to figure out what's the path forward, and yet you have to be willing to take a risk. And then the last thing I'll say before I fire it back to you is, you know, President Carter wasn't just a risk taker. He was also some somebody during his presidency and since who didn't mind speaking hard truths to a friend. And, the, and, and, and he, as a friend of Israel, as somebody who you know, worked so hard to find this peace deal where Egypt would normalize relationships with Israel. He was also willing to be tough, including tough publicly in Israel over treatment of the Palestinians. I think he has a belief, and I think he, any of us in life, you know, do you know somebody's a, really a friend if you haven't had a disagree with, disagreement with them? Disagreement is what tests friendships. Uh, just agreeing with somebody all the time may, may mean you're a fake friend, not a real friend, but 
but being able to have a tough conversation about areas where you disagree and say, and I'm having this conversation with you because I'm your friend, and I would expect you to, th to do the same for me as a friend. President Carter was willing to do that. And so I think most of us, if we think about Jimmy and, and Rosalind's legacy, there's, there's many components to it. But I see it as all kind of flowing from a spring of he grew up in a time. I mean, even Mark talked about the split in his own Baptist church over civil rights. He grew up in a time where as a person, then as a governor, then as a president, then as a global leader and post-president, healing was always something that was in his mind. And, and he believed he, you know, that a mission on earth was to do that. Tell about your family's own experience, both kind of the governor to governor in the South at a challenging time, but then the later experiences between your both sets of, of Holtons and, and Carters. Uh, well, yes, I'll start with the fact that my parents um, and the Carters were governors together. Dad was elected uh, as the first Republican governor uh, since Reconstruction, the first Republican governor of Virginia since uh, uh, for 100 years. And that was because the Democratic Party had become, it was the Dixiecrat Party, really, in Virginia, a one-party state, uh, and through poll taxes and other means had effectively reduced the uh, uh, the voting uh, electorate to 10% of the population who participated in the, the, the Democratic primaries and chose who was in leadership roles. And really, it was Harry Byrd chose who was in the leadership roles because... Mm -hmm. He decided who could run. And my dad came back from uh, World War II, having served in the Navy in the Pacific to this world that was, uh, made no sense that 10% of the population was choosing our leaders and worked really from that when he came back from the war straight through to when he was elected in gov governor in 1969 to create a two-party system in Virginia and did though it was complicated because the parties all switched afterwards and realigned with the national parties, essentially. But he was elected as a Republican in 1969, took office in 1970, and then uh, President Carter was elected governor of Georgia the following year, so elected in 1970 and took office in 1971. And they did get to know each other as governors. They served, uh, and governors have a rich tradition in the U.S., you all know this, of uh, well, being problem solvers, first of all, much closer to the the front lines of their communities and uh, and uh, working together. So the National Governors Association has a long tradition going back to uh, at least when my dad and, and President Carter were in office. Uh, and there are also other associations. So they each would have belonged to their respective partisan organizations, dad, uh, met regularly with the RGA, the Republican Governors Association. I'm sure President Carter did with the DGA. But there was also a Southern Governors um, Association that met, met regularly and conferred and, and shared knowledge and opportunities with each other. And um, so they would have been together at those um, NGA and SGA meetings. My memories of them were all, I was 12 years old. They were always somewhere beautiful and fun, and there was always events for the children. So you know, that, that's my memories, um, um, and I don't remember knowing, I don't remember what uh, their daughter's age is relative to us, but we didn't, I don't have any memories of getting getting to know her um, there. But I do have this sense of my dad in his act interactions with President Carter, well, being in this spirit that President Carter, when he was elected, got a lot of attention as the, the uh, occasionally anyway, being called the first governor of the New South. And dad would rib him uh, mercilessly. Well, no, I was a year ahead of you. And so, uh, but they were both governors of the New South. And it's an interesting thing to reflect on kind of where we are now, because there was this uh, sense of rejuvenation and there was, there was some reality to it of rejuvenation of the South and uh, democratization of the South um, um, and coming into really coming into the 21st coming into the then 20th century. And can I say something before you talk about your mom yeah, and, yeah. and dad and the Carters as a couple? So again, just kind of going back to this moment in time, both parties really were realigning. Um, again, the Democratic Party was kind of trying to shed, needed to shed this Dixiecrat label. When, when LBJ got the Civil Rights Act passed in the 60s, he said the Democratic Party may lose the South for 40 years. He actually underestimated to some degree the effect that that would have. But the um, 
at the same time as Linwood was running for governor in 1969, there was also a movement in the Democratic Party in Virginia that was led mostly by Northern Virginia Democrats to take down the burden machine from within. And so th there was a, a, a number of young people, a lot of more young World War II vets who were coming in to office. Um, the governor of Tennessee, who was elected the year after your dad, who was the first Republican in Tennessee, came up with then aide Lamar Alexander, who became governor and senator, to meet with Linwood in the governor's mansion to say, how, do you, how can you be a Republican governor in the South? We haven't had him for, for decades. Your dad had a legislature that was less than 10% Republican. But Carter was dealing with the, the different issue, which is the Democratic Party in Georgia had been segregationist and less dramatic. I mean, these some pivotal figures in the civil rights movement in the South were Democratic segregationists. And so he, your, your dad was trying to reform a, a system by creating vigorous two-party, a competitive party, and folks like Carter were trying to reform a system from within by really changing their party ID. So they had they were similar in age, and they had some really similar challenges in the South. And, and despite the ups and downs over the time system, both of them did really help bring their states forward into the modern era. So both states and many other places in the South, much more cosmopolitan than they were before, much more diverse much more educated and much more economically successful, um, uh, starting really with that, that early 70s period. Um, so yeah. my, my parents, really my, my parents' more personal interactions, and they had lots of interactions with the Carters over the years. Dan was very, very involved with the Miller Center on the presidency at UVA, and Carter came up and did events with them there. They interacted in various contexts over the years, but where their real friendship, uh, I think, um, uh, dates to is my mom was a habitat builder um, and was very, very major champion for Habitat for Humanity in Virginia, local habitats, and did first lady builds. She and I did a number of first lady builds together after Tim's, during and after Tim's time as governor. And she would be out there, act back in the back, hammering. She's in her 80s by this point, And I would be out front talking to the press. She would come out and say, well, are we building or talking? Give me grief about it because she was a very serious habitat builder. But she also, she and a number of her friends uh, got involved in the um, Jimmy Carter Blitz builds. And so, would, and these were the ones where uh, Jimmy himself led um, uh, the habitat effort to go into a community, say, in South Africa, where, which was one of many places she went with him, um, where they would go into a community and build 100 houses in a week and have local volunteers working with international volunteers coming, fo folks coming from all over the world, but including folks coming from the U.S. And so my mom did blitz builds, the Jimmy Carter blitz builds all over the world uh, uh, and in the U.S., West Virginia and the, one of the Dakotas and uh, Eastern Europe. And uh, I can't remember all where some of the more colorful stories were from the South Africa build. But on all of those, she was out there swinging a hammer, and so was he, and so was Roslyn. That they were very, I mean, their con their interaction with Habitat was definitely in a leadership role, but it was also a servant leader role, leading by being absolutely out front and swinging hammers. They, on that, when I was on that divide between my mother and me over talking to the press and swinging hammers, I'm sure they did plenty of both, but they were swinging hammers regularly. And so mom... Um, got to know them both better through that work, and then through that really developed, uh, 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 blossomed a friendship. They came and spent a weekend with my parents in the Northern Neck, where my parents lived for the last 20 years of their lives, including, uh, well, and lived on a, a, a modest little house on, a, on a, a creek, as they call it, meaning a little body of water that flowed into the, the rivers that then flowed into the Chesapeake Bay. And the Carters came and spent a weekend with them there. And just very, uh, well, I, I, but my takeaway, it's just very humble people. And you all know that about the Carters, just very down to earth servant leaders. And again, that comes back to their faith. All right, I'm going to throw one back okay. to you. Good. So this came maybe the, a big challenge for us today is uh, the polarization in our um, in U.S. society today. Um, and... We've obviously talked about what some of what Carter did to help bridge build. What what are the lessons we can take from the Carters, both of their approaches um, to reaching across? Are there are there lessons from that 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 
help us think about what we do to address the really, really troubling polarization in our American society and specifically in politics today? Well, you know, we're all living it now, right? So we're, we're seeing polarization every day. But again, to just jump you back to 1976, that was a very tough time. We, we sometimes think we might be seeing polarization or issues like that nobody else has ever seen. And there are some aspects of what we're living through now that I've, that I've not seen in 65 years. But in terms of polarization, it was so sharp in, in that 76, in the run up to the 76 election, the, the argument about the Nixon impeachment and his resignation, you know, he's a crook versus he doesn't do anything different than any other politician does. Why should he be impeached? I mean, it, there was a real intense polarization around the figure of the, of the president. And um, so I think the, you know, I think, and Jimmy Carter, when he got into that race in 1976, he was not the favorite. There were a lot of senators running who had national profiles. Carter was viewed as sort of the least known. Now, he'd been elected governor of a big state, but he was the least known of the candidates. But he offered, he was offering newness. He was offering optimism. He was offering healing. And I would say the optimism that we're, we're kind of better than the chapter we've been living through and, and we can be better, America, I think that was a key to him. And, you know, the, the critique of President Carter during his four-year term was there were tough issues, Arab oil embargo and um, intense inflation that was driven by the oil embargo. And some critiqued him for in, in the moment, not necessarily meeting him with the super optimistic spirit that he might have shown in the campaign. So I think one lesson from President Carter is in, in a polarizing time, it's not just about asking people to work together and listen to each other, which he was good at, but it's also about trying to be upbeat. And, and the need to be upbeat without sugarcoating, whitewashing, being too pie in the sky. I mean, that, that's a hard thing for a leader. I, I don't think I ever really grasped this, this part of the psychology of leadership till I was governor. I was mayor, but, but I, I think I'm a naturally upbeat person. And that, that kind of came through. When I was governor, you know, the shooting at Virginia Tech and the big economic collapse of 2008, 2009, there were some really significant crises during my four year as governor. And I, and I started to really understand this, the need to be upbeat. People want to feel hope. They want to feel optimism. They don't want to be lied to. They don't want to be, you know, bamboozled, but they want to believe that their leaders still see enough good in the situation that, yeah, we'll get through the tough times. Sure. We'll get through it because we're tough people. And I think, um, I think that, that aspect of Carter's campaign uh, at a really hard time that in some ways was every bit as gross and polarized as today. That's what turned this kind of little known governor who was not given much chance into this is going to be our nominee. This is going to be our president. You and I've talked about optimism as a part of the role of leaders and how sometimes it's, uh, shall we say, more of a choice than a, an a, a assessment of the facts. <laughs> And it's frankly, over time, it's sometimes gotten even harder because the facts, assessing the facts might lead you to be a pessimist. You have a saying that, did it come so, from your mother? Yeah, my mother. So one day my mother, when I was in high school, heard me saying something kind of snarky and cynical and pessimistic. And she said, you know, here's the choice of life. You get to decide whether you would rather be right or do right. Now, if you'd rather be right, yeah, go ahead and be a pessimist. Because things will often work out badly and you can say when you're right. And nobody ever says, I told you so when something works out good. They only say, I told you so when something works out bad. So if you want to be right, be a pessimist. But if you'd rather do right, be an optimist. Because optimism will, in an intangible way, kind of shape a reality and, and move things in a positive direction. And so my mother sort of gave me that challenge as a kid, would you rather be right or do right? And I, I kind of think like Ian, that optimism... Uh, is is sometimes more of a willed uh, attitude rather than an evidence based conclusion, uh, but but you're more likely to work an item to its uh, to a positive end by being optimistic, and to, and remember the other reason for optimism is we don't know what we don't know, so we may look at a scenario before us and see nothing particularly hopeful. Like what's what is the next chapter in Venezuela? I mean, I'm on the Foreign Relations Committee, I'm the chairman of the America Subcommittee, and we I just we find ourselves really grappling with this. How's the situation in Haiti going to resolve? I'm mentioning America's situations because that's where my expertise is. We don't see it today, but that's not saying it's not there and that we might not 
hear it tomorrow through somebody else's mouth. I don't have to, I don't have all the good ideas, but somebody else might. So optimism is also a way to um, ward off uh, unnecessary pessimism, giving up on something too soon. I mean, I'm, I'm Irish, you know, for hundreds of years, like nobody thought that there could be peace uh, between, you know, Catholic Ireland and more um, Protestant North Ireland. And it would have been impossible to imagine that. Now the young people grow up in Ireland, it's impossible for them to imagine what it was like even 30 years ago. So you, you, being an optimist also wards off premature uh, giving up, and that's a really important thing. And I would say you're in my optimism is, is, is like the Carters, rooted in faith, and it was for them very much rooted in faith. Uh, well, here, I think that leads into a, uh, well into a next question, which I'll ask, which is this Carter School does such amazing work all around the world, such amazing scholarly work, but also such amazing work trying to connect scholarly um, uh, understandings to realities in the world. What, if any, advice or suggestions or thoughts do you have for how institutions like the Carter School can be a positive force in the world during this time of conflict? Um, well, let me let me offer two. One's about students and one's about faculty and researchers. And and this is something I've been thinking a whole lot about in the last 10 days because of because of Israel and and Gaza. Um what what is what is the most important role that we can play in the world as Americans? I'm a US senator, so I need to focus on what's the most important role we can play in the world. You know, I might argue that the most important role we can play is taking responsibility for creating a society here where you could live on the same street as somebody who's Jewish, Muslim, Christian, no religion, and be great neighbors. Your kids can go to the same school and sit next to each other. You can work side by side with colleagues whose skin color is different than yours, whose accent is different than yours, whose sexual orientation, gender identity, different than yours. And 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 you can and we can do that and make it work. We have to we have to take that responsibility seriously. A because for our own quality of life, we would want that to be true. We want to be a welcome and compassionate community. Even with 330 million people, it's awful big. We can do that. But but B, this is what can affect the world. An awful lot of people live in parts of the world where they can't live together, work together if their religions are different. It's difficult to send your kids to the same schools if your ethnic group is different. And because of that, many people in the world don't think it's possible. They don't think it's possible. So they might prematurely give up on the ability to have a better tomorrow because they haven't seen the example in their life of a community composed of really different people with different points of view, but who nevertheless can make it work. And so one is now to come to your question. And if we do it right here and people can see, well, there's an example of a society where people can exist in harmony, though their backgrounds be different, then they not only can think some things about us, but they can also believe, well, we can do it here too, because we're fundamentally people or people of people in the United States can do it, we can do it here too. So I think I think we owe a civility, we have a responsibility to forming a compassionate community here as goal one, both for our own well being, but also for the, the the message that it would send out. So what what how does that translate into the Carter School at Mason? Okay, first students. A, Bring together students from all kinds of different backgrounds. Bring together students, including international students, from countries where if they were studying in their own native country, they might not be able to interact with a student that's sitting across the table from them. Equip students with an understanding that there are basic human values that, and basic human dreams and basic human fears that people share, and that we can construct from those, even though there may be superficial differences of language or ethnicity or whatever, we can construct from those basic fears, anxieties, and dreams. We can construct a community. And then bring together researchers. So I'm on the, now on the researcher faculty side. Um, I know because I've interacted with Carter School faculty and researchers that you have people of some really impressive backgrounds who've come from countries under intense stress and challenge, and they have that experience to offer to students. But but what about you know, I, what I and I don't know. I could have asked the end this, but I didn't. The, does the Carter School 
you know, affirmatively say, well, here's a trouble spot in the world right now. There's some intense division in this part of the world. Could we invite a scholar and a researcher, not just one, but from different points of view in that community and in this space, make it a completely safe and welcoming space to get to know one another, work together, to research together, to publish together, to, to offer messages back home together. And so I think giving students this experience of what it is to create a community from different points of view, but then maybe inviting researchers and academics who have the capacity through working together to then be agents of healing in their homes. That would be a real fitting, you know, kind of a connection to the Carter's example. Well, I neglected to point out that I was going to open it up for questions from you all. And so I'll filibuster for a minute, having told you that I'm about to do that. If you have any final thoughts you want to add before we do that, feel free. But I'll just add the, on your point about creating a caring community where we can express conflict. I know President Washington was with you all this morning, and he may or may not have shared this already, but I know one moment, well, we're all proud of the fact that Mason is a big tent and that we've got a lot of different uh, uh, new points and, and passionately held uh, positions. And they do seem to uh, exist together, coexist together under the Mason umbrella, sometimes with interactions and sometimes by sort of staying in our separate corners. Uh, but to the extent we can find ways to bring folks together, even within the Mason community for more dialogue. I think that also is a, a great opportunity. And the one I hope that President Washington may have shared, that he's very proud of the moment sometime within the last year or so when issues about women's reproductive freedom were very much um, um, on the um, well, raw emotions uh, uh, were prevailing. There was a protest, and I think it was right out here on, on Mason Square on the plaza here, but where groups protesting on dip opposite sides of those issues were both present and managed to work out essentially rules of engagement so that they weren't shouting over each other. They were taking turns shouting, perhaps, but they weren't shouting over each other and managed to come off with the, the mutual protests in a uh, civil fashion that uh, didn't devolve into chaos. And, and, you know, those are just baby steps, but uh, that's the kind of thing, yes, we here at Mason, because we do have uh, uh, diverse viewpoints uh, represented uh, as something we can do. We're big plans. Qu questions. Hi, Suzanne Gase. I got my master's at ICAR, what's now the Carter School in 1996, and I'm a conflict resolution practitioner. Uh, so grateful to have you here. I'm curious to hear both your perspectives on the extent to which Congress as an institution still works. That's his special group. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I think the Article 1, you know, it, it, here's an interesting thought. When I came to Congress in 2013 in the Senate, I thought the Article 1 branch was broken. I thought the Article 2 branch, you might like or not like the existing president, but the Article 2 branch wasn't broken. And the Article 3 branch, you might like or not like the Supreme Court, but the Article 3 branch was not broken. I think there's evidence of cracks in all three right now. Um, and I think the Article 1 branch is is not irrepar irreparably broken, but I think the combination of sort of media climate, fundraising, et cetera, has, has pushed the Article 1 branch into you know, kind of a performative. The, the ratio between the performative and the substantive is way off. Um, and so, and, and yet, when I ran, I asked John Warner for advice, who was a very dear friend of our family. And I was running against another friend of his, George Allen, so he wouldn't endorse me. He stayed out of it. But the one piece of advice he gave me is he said, look, if you'd asked me for advice about running for the Senate 50 years ago, I would have said, well, run if you have a 1% chance of winning, because it's like the perfect job. It couldn't be a better job. He said, I can't tell you that now. He said, a variety of things have made it much harder in Congress. He said, but it's not sick building syndrome and it's not in the water supply. It's in the, it's in the inclinations of people who walk into the building every day. And we just need a higher percentage of people willing to walk into the building who will not measure their success by how often they can get on TV or, you know, um, or, or how many social media followers they have. And so I, I do think I think we got a challenge. The one thing that sometimes gives me hope when I have almost no hope is I don't think 
American history in any dimension is a one-way path to success or failure. It's a sine wave. And we go through cycles where things are good, things are bad, things are good, things are bad. Sometimes the best moments come right after some of the worst and vice versa. So that means if, if, if the future would be a representation of the past, which I believe it will be, we're going through a tough challenge right now. But I don't, I'm not despairing that we can't find a better path ahead. I'll, I'll chime in just on that to say, watching Tim and his colleagues in Congress, you know, one thing they actually do there because of the nature of their work is bring people together from different viewpoints. And you do have friendships across the aisle and you do have real conversations across the aisle. And once in a while, you actually find opportunities to work yeah, together. So in a way, the Senate, I won't try to speak to the other house. I don't know it as well. But the Senate is, uh, um, as a microcosm of people actually working on a day-to-day -day basis in a civil fashion together across differences, it's it's doing a lot better than some parts. Yeah. I mean, in two and a half years, we've done a bipartisan infrastructure bill, manufacturing bill, veterans bill, marriage equality bill, fixed the Electoral Count Act, and the first a gun safety bill we've done um, in, since 1986. So there have been some big bipartisan achievements, even in a divided time. But I'm always, like Edison said, discontent is the first sign of progress. So when you're, you're always going to focus on the thing you haven't done. We haven't done enough on climate. We haven't done enough on immigration reform. We haven't done enough on gun safety. So I can give you some bipartisan achievements, but I'm, my mind is already stressing about the one that we haven't done and the need for reform. Thank you for being here, Senator. Uh, I'm Dr. Elaine Serrano. I'm a member of the advisory board here for the Carter's Club. And I'm also the... Uh, associate rector of a Ukrainian university in, uh, that works very closely right now with the Department of State and, of course, the Ukrainian government because they're a Ukrainian university. So uh, my question for you has to do to go back to an important period of time, 2016. You were uh, Hillary Clinton's running mate. And how do you see her voice regarding the Palestinian people, which was prescient, really, about what needed to be done to make sure that the voices and the identities of the Palestinian people were recognized and addressed, and how things have thus played out. So you're, you're testing my memory a little bit because, I mean, I was on the ticket with Hillary for 105 days, and we did all kinds of events together. And I have, I have a couple of recollections of talking about Israel, Palestine, Middle East with her. Not not many, but um, I do remember what we were secreted out of our house in Richmond to get by press once to fly up to New York because she wanted to talk to us as she was trying to decide who to have on the ticket. And we talked a good bit about the Middle East then. Reality's changed a lot from 2016 to 2024. So I think in 2016, I, I believe Hillary and virtually everybody. President Trump was a little bit of an anomaly, but the GOP generally, you know, we still really operated out of the, the UN framework that we want to have a, a Israel and Palestine peaceful, peacefully living side by side, and that should be the dream. And we're not there yet. It's been really, really tough. That should be the dream. And so I'm sure, I don't want to put words in her mouth, but my recollection would be that as we were talking in 2016, that was still the desired state, and that and that was formal U.S. policy under Democratic and Republican presidents for a very long time. I I have found I've been to Israel I think more times than I've been to any other country. When I go to Israel, I always go to Israel, then I go over to East Jerusalem or other places in Palestine to make sure I'm hearing from folks. I started to hear about that time and subsequently much less discussion among young people I would interact with about two state. Instead, what people would say is that's for politicians. Equal civil rights is what we want. And that, that could be one state or it could be two state, but the discussion was moving from a political discussion about boundaries and one state or two state to let's just all be treated, you know, kind of equal human rights. So that that discussion started to morph. And that led me to be sad, but not completely surprised. We recently had the Israeli president, President Herzog, uh, come and speak to us in Congress in a joint session. It was a very good session, but the word two-state solution was not mentioned. And, and of anything about that speech, that was the thing that kind of struck me. 
And so on the ground, the conversations I've been having over the last few years suggest to me that young people probably have they've either given up on it or they or, or they're focused on a different direction. And so that 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 is sort of and that's really kind of at the root of so much that uh, is there right now. The official U.S. policy has still been a two state, two states, Israel and Palestine, living peacefully side by side. But but the president of Israel and the folks that I'm you know hearing on the street in Israel and Palestine, that's not necessarily what they're saying to us. Which leaves the question then of, okay, then what would be the new chapter or the new reality that would accomplish the, you know, treat all humans as humans goal. And so that last part is not a Hillary, that's not a Hillary thought, that's just more subsequent, between 2016 and 2023, that's been seven years. Um, how have the, how have hearts and minds changed? And I, and I, I will, I'll just conclude by saying, I don't consider myself an expert on this. I'm a very well-educated layperson, and I have been to Israel and Palestine a lot. Um, so the, I'm not giving you the answer that if somebody was sitting here and they're a Palestinian in the West Bank or Gaza or something, an Israeli, that, you know, I, they may give you a different answer, but that's been my observation the last few years. The next panel will have all the answers. Yeah. Yeah, that's the next panel is on the Camp David Accord in the aftermath. Yeah. Right. You tell them I said. Thank you very much to both of you for this fascinating discussion. Uh, my name is Amy Austin Holmes. I'm at the Elliott School at the Institute for Security and Conflict Studies. And I've also worked at the State Department, actually with Megan at the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations. Um, so my question is, over the past year, and especially the past few weeks in particular, there's been um, you know, a dramatic increase in targeting of civilians across various regions in the world, from Ukraine to Armenians yeah. in Nagorno-Karabakh right. uh, to Syria, now Israel um, and Gaza, et cetera. So what more could either the U.S. Senate in particular do or the U.S. government specifically to protect civilians and prevent the destruction of civilian infrastructure um, in various uh, places around the world? And perhaps if we could do that more systematically, that would also help contribute to decreasing polarization because right. we would highlight these commonalities um, in, in the different regions of the world. So Yeah, you. and it's Amy? Amy yeah, Austin so Holmes here. Well, I'll just uh, start out with saying that uh, I do think to tie it to our our reason for gathering today that President Carter was a great champion of uh, international human rights and you know, instituted helped institute the reporting the now annual reporting uh, to Congress on on human rights violations around the world. And so your question is one that theme would have cared past and would care past me about. Um. I, I, I want to really think about this question because 9-11 was a targeting of civilians. And so I want to I want to kind of go back in my mind and think, is this a new phenomenon or is it a long term phenomenon? But I agree with you that that may be one way to think about the challenges of the of the, that we're living in in terms of devising solutions. You know, we we cannot necessarily convince next door neighboring governments to get along. We can't do everything. But. But if you could if you could form a better consensus surrounding um, however you work out your differences, the targeting of civilians should be off limits that that would be such a game changer. It would be so positive. And yet it really does seem like, you know, from the I mean, I'm going back to and the the German bombing of Guernica during the Spanish Civil War. That was terrorizing civilians. Um, you know, German fighters on the side of Franco decided to bomb this town in the Basque region. Picasso's famous painting, the Guernica, was probably one of the most famous anti-war works of art of all time. And it was not about the airplanes. It was about targeting civilians. And some of the technologies that were developed in World War I that had been used against military populations chemical weapons, uh, aerial bombardment started to get turned to civilians. We could go earlier in history and I guess find instances too of where somebody decided, I'm going to get an edge over my opponent. Maybe I won't have it on the battlefield, but if I can go against their civilians, that will do so. So what, yeah, so your your question is, what could we do in the Senate and the Foreign Relations Committee in global forums? The U.S. is back in the U.N. Human Rights Council. That's an interesting, just take a minute on that. The U.N. Human Rights Council has perennially been 
something that drives the U.S. nuts because they they spend disproportionate amount of their time bashing Israel. Could there could there be human rights issues in Israel? Sure, there should be, but there's in a lot of other nations too. And if you're spending you know sixty percent of your time on Israel and ignoring other areas of the world, then there's a double standard there. However, for that reason, President Trump pulled the U.S. out of the UN UN Human Rights Council. I went over to visit with Michelle Bachelet when she was the commissioner. And she said, I get it. I get it why you're frustrated. But don't you know, everything gets worse if you're not there. You think it's bad with you there. No, it gets worse. It gets worse for every cause. It gets worse for LGBTQ equality. It gets worse for everything if you're not at the table. So the, the U.S. is now back at the U.N. Human Rights Council. And if you know about the U.N., you know that on the Security Council, there's a veto power. So if Russia wants to veto a resolution about Ukraine, they can do it. They can't do it at the U.S. Human, U.N. Human Rights Council. It's a straight vote, and and the council kicked Russia off after the Ukraine invasion, and Russia just tried to get back on, and they were not voted on. So you could maybe the way to accomplish this could be through the Senate, could be through institutions like that, which though imperfect, at least have shown some willingness to to ha you know stand up and have a backbone on human rights issues. So I'm I'm gonna let that one marinate a little bit, but that's a that's a good challenge to take. Hi, uh, my name is Mark Gopin. I want to thank you, Anne, for that shepherding seven dog years. Uh, <laughs> that was a wonderful gesture. We appreciated it very much. I remember that time, that year vividly. Um, I want to ask both of you, um, you know, in the 90s, I was deeply involved with, uh, with uh, an amazing effort on Capitol Hill that brought together congressmen who are Republican and Democrat on a spiritual level. It's called the Faith and Politics Institute, and it was a, a private support system, basically. And, a, and a, there are a lot of people who made fun of it on either side, but in the end of the day, it was John Lewis, Amo Houghton, you know, extraordinary people with extraordinary character, and it evinced a certain, you know, in the research, there's a vast difference between private religion and, and political religion. Private religion increases tolerance, political religion destroys tolerance. And so I'm just wondering... Why do you think it's impossible to do that right now, to have that similar kind of effort on Capitol Hill, where where spirituality and religion, the kind that Jimmy had, would would be a bond between people to prevent a January sixth, to prevent uh, Christian nationalism, etc. Why is that impossible now? And what do you think you could do to actively recreate? at least a minority of people on both sides would be willing to do that in order to create an alternative ethical, uh, spiritual relationship between conservative and progressive in the country. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to tell you some family, you know, just family stories about the Senate. So faith in politics started in the house by these two members, one Democrat, one Republican, both very amazing figures. Um, and, and faith in politics still exists, but it's not bipartisan anymore. Um, on the Senate side, it's bipartisan maybe at one event a year, the Civil Rights Pilgrimage to the South. But in terms of the interactions within the body, it ceased being bipartisan. A number of members of my party um, got elected from the House to the Senate and started a faith in politics chapter, even though these are friends of mine uh, I'll be candid. They have not prioritized having it be bipartisan. They're all Democrats. They're across different faith. They're, oh, yeah. Very, very ecumenical. Buddhist, Jewish, Christian, spiritual, but not tied to a religious tradition. So very ecumenical, but not bipartisan. There's a there's a counter group in the Senate called the Senate Prayer Breakfast, which was started by evangelical Christians in the 1950s. Meets once a week, every Wednesday morning scrupulously nonpartisan in this way. The speaker is always a senator or former senator, and it alternates between the Democrat and Republican every week. So 36 weeks a year, we're in session. We'll hear from 18 Democrats. We'll hear from 18 Republicans. To come to the breakfast, you have to be senator, former senator, or Senate chaplain. It's a very small group. Um, I, I started off in the Senate going to faith and politics one week and going to the Senate prayer breakfast the other week. But I found that in terms of like really getting to know what made my colleagues tick, it was better for me to go to the one that was bipartisan, the Senate prayer breakfast, because it's less ecumenical, but it's more bipartisan. And um, 
you know, I, I really find that that hour every week where us, you know, after opening prayers and, you know, putting people on prayer lists who are sick or who are having challenges, we hear from a senator for about 20 minutes. And it might be their faith journey. It might be, you know, my life has been scarred by gun violence and I just want to share that with you. I'm going through a tough family situation. Anybody have any advice for me? We talk about everything. And keep it in the room with each other, but it, we get to know one another very, very well, and it's it's a I, I find it to be a really great thing, as long as we kind of respect it as a confidential thing, you know, like we're just because we really would bear our souls to each other to get to know one another. My friend Jerry Connolly is here, Jeremy. I'll make you laugh at this. Roy Blunt, the former senator from Missouri, was a really common attendee at the prayer breakfast, and Roy used to always say, "You know what?" It's really hard to stab somebody in the back after you've been a prayer break. Not not impossible, but it's really hard. <laughs> and, so so I I have found that, and you know Jerry is a guy of just a deep faith background, but I have found I, if I go to the prayer breakfast on Wednesdays and I come out of a kind of Jesuit Catholic social justice tradition, and I'm going with you know uh, very evangelical Southern Republicans, um, but I'm I'm really learning a lot from them. And sometimes I'm not just learning like about them. They say something that makes me think, well, you know, I've always thought about an issue this way, but you know, that that's actually, that gives me a different perspective. So um, that you always have the experience, then you think they're going to vote with you on the floor on something they don't. <laughs> and then you get mad at them, but then you think, well, wait, am I, am I going to the prayer breakfast just to, you know, get somebody's vote or am I going to the prayer breakfast to like learn something? So the, the good news is it, it does go on and it's probably my favorite hour of the week. Um, it does go on, but our attendance is tiny, you know, on a, on a good week, we may have 20, um, more commonly it might be 15, but at least it's bipartisan. And, and it's one of the few things I do every week that is very bipartisan and, and truly substantive and meaningful, not just superficial. Well, I'm getting my time sign, but I'm going to take the, uh, personal priority to ask, uh, prerogative to ask uh, my undergraduate friend. Jawad, to tell, just give us the 30-second version of this project you're working on that has a tie to President Carter. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Professor Holston. Uh, I'm an undergraduate student and part of a student organization that does refugee advocacy on campus. And we're basically trying to uh, implement a federal program to sponsor refugee students to come to the U.S. to George Mason University so that they can continue their education. And... Uh, President Carter, Carter has been an inspiration to us because he helped design the 1980 Refugee Act, mm. which was passed, by the way, with bipartisan support and unanimous support in the U.S. Senate. Wow. And uh, I, I was just wondering how can we continue that legacy of welcome that President Carter advocated for, uh, especially at an era where immigration is such a divisive issue. Well, and, it, wow. and we all have to step up to the plate on all the time, and I love the welcoming the work that you and other students are doing to welcome people to our campus. You've got a 30 second response. Yeah. Otherwise, he's going to get the. All right. I'm going to I don't want to cut into Jerry's time, but I'm just going to tell you this. You know, immigration reform has was not a partisan issue for a very long time. The last big immigration reform was 1986. President Reagan was president. Democrats had the House majority. And it was it was done that that deal now would have people yelling at Reagan and calling him a amnesty open borders guy. That was a practical solution, a compromise. My my education as a senator really began six months after I came into the Senate. We passed a bipartisan immigration reform bill, 70 votes in the Senate, big bipartisan margin. I knew the Republican House was not going to just pass our bill. They wanted to do their own version, but I thought they would do their own version. And then we would have a conference between a Democratic Senate bill and a House Republican bill. We would cut split the difference and we would do a bill. And said nothing happened because the House, the Republican House, wouldn't take it up. So, and then President Trump really made immigration like the third rail issue, the third rail issue, made people afraid to touch it. We were twice, well, once during the Trump administration, close to a deal, border security in exchange for complete protection for a robust universe of dreamers. President told us he would do that deal, but as soon as we introduced the bill with bipartisan support, he did a 180, reversed it, and killed our opportunity to pass it. But I'm not despairing about it, and I'll tell you why. Our unemployment rate is so low right now that every employer that I meet with, ag, school boards, looking for bus drivers and teachers, hospitals, construction, 
hospitality industry, every industry is saying, you got to have immigration reform. We just did an infrastructure bill. Who's going to build it? We just did a manufacturing bill. Who's going to make it? We're committing to doing shipbuilding with, for the Aussies. Who's going to do the shipbuilding? And so all of the stars are aligning around, we can't meet the nation's workforce needs without immigration reform. So what I'm saying to every group that I talk to, Chambers of Commerce, the Farm Bureau, is I'm not asking you to go out on a limb for a non-existent proposal. And if you see a, a partisan proposal put on the table, it's not going anywhere because it's going to have to get through a Senate and get 60 votes, at least 10 Republican votes. And it's going to have to get through a Republican House. But as soon as you see bipartisan proposals on the table, we really need we really need everybody to lean in. We need our universities to lean in. You know, your students are having a harder time getting visas to come here. You want to attract great professors and research talent. It's harder to do that. So we're going to need everybody leaning in once we have a bipartisan proposal on the table. And the door is opening up to that for the first time since I've been here because of the low unemployment rate. Well, thank you. What great fun to be with you. Thank you, Dean. Okay, thank you.